And I am going to welcome Associate Professor Peter Field to the floor to give us our talk the, for this evening. Um, Peter is my lovely boss, um, my <laughs> line manager, um, uh, so I have only good things to say about him. <laughs> <laughs> but in all honesty, he's a fabulous boss. He um, has always um, backed the Tees Museum and made it possible for us to um, be adventurous and take on new challenges together. Um, so it's a real pleasure to welcome you to give the talk this evening. Thank you for that. Um, it's a delight to be here, so thanks to Terry. Um, if you didn't get a chance, we have a wonderful exhibit next door, um, a vloggy collection in the Tees Museum. Um, and it's great to be in the Art Center. I'd say more about this, but I don't have much time. In fact, I'm certain that I have more to say than the time will allot, uh, is allotted. But I think we're really proud to have this campus, right? And it's good to remind ourselves that whatever we do in Ilum and in our labs and in the in the library. No, that's all right. It's all right. If we can't share it, right, with the public, if we can't bring it out of the campus and into the into the marketplace of ideas and into the public, it's really not worth it. So it's a great thing to have this campus, this part of it. And if the buses go by and it's loud on Hereford Street, we have students working out in a consortium upstairs, music, so that could be loud. People will be going back and forth. I couldn't think of a better way to have a talk. <laughs> uh, really. I'm from New York City, and it was always loud on Amsterdam Avenue. Um, so there we go. All right, so I best move into this. And note that uh, thank you, Terry, again, for thinking of the title. Terry helped with this, um, <laughs> right? And it's worked. So Radio New Zealand interviewed me yesterday morning. Um, so that was fun enough. I was surprised. Um, there's going to be a piece in the conversation tomorrow. I could read you that bit, it's over there, but I won't. But suffice it to say, the editor thought that by far the most fun part was the part <laughs> I'm going to skip over pretty quickly. So, <laughs> you are often asked about it. I'll, I'll just make a little gambit, and the gambit is an analogy. And the analogy goes something like this, that, of course, news is fairly new, right? We only think of the fourth estate, maybe in the Enlightenment, newspaper men really not till the 19th century. And of course, fake news is a variant of that. So it's a long way to go to say, well, if there wasn't news in the ancient world, then there wasn't fake news. So you can leave now, right? It's nonsense, right, in some way. But I think we can make a little bit of analogy when we associate fake news with Donald Trump. He was largely the purveyor of the term. And it was his view that if you were watching CNN or NBC or a few of the people might be reading the New York Times, that they were getting systematic misinformation, right? So what you had is falsehood masquerading as truth, right? And that was the, the, the basis of the notion of fake news. But at the same time, we've also flipped it around, right? We associated with Trump, and that Trump was, was full of fat guano. I don't know, right? He was full of it. And therefore, he was fact-checked regularly by the New York Times and the Washington Post, and that that also came to be sort of fake news. So either side you're on, either way you want to look at it, there is a sense that information and truth and a kind of agreement about truth is a central part, maybe the building block of public debate. And that public debate and free debate is the essence of democracy. So if you want to destroy democracy, then fake news or systematic misinforming of the public is a great way, maybe the way to go, right? And we shouldn't be surprised that lots of people in Trump's administration were reading Thucydides' history, right? And lots of talk about Thucydides' trap. I'll get to that in a few moments, if time permitting. Um, but but there, there's that idea. So the analogy is, while it would be terrible to compare Thucydides to, to Trump, and across 26 centuries, I don't want to come back and bludgeoning me. Um, nevertheless, I think there is a comparison to be made or an analogy. So Trump is to fake news in some way as Thucydides is to Homer. <laughs> and that's a tough analogy. How about this? As Thucydides is to myth and Homeric myth, that in the same way that there is a sense that the American democracy is greatly at risk because of systematic misinformation, because of fake news. Similarly, I believe Thucydides and Plato, who are contemporaries, were convinced that Athens, or Athenian citizens, the demos, 
were being systematically miseducated. And they thought that systematic miseducation came from, of course, the great teacher of Athens, who is Homer. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, are you with me? You're okay with that? That's the plan. Now let's go back and talk about some history. And if you want to talk about the analogy later on, if we have time, we will. So a brief story about Athens. Um, let's remember that um, Athens is what? The, the, the democratic child, right? The, the great star in the Greek firmament. A Greek firmament, which in its own way sort of comes together. We kind of get to know it through what? The Iliad and Helen, I think that means sort of Greek, right? And off to Troy, and the stories of Homer in the epics of the Iliad and Odyssey. And they date from, right? They're not written, they get written down later, from maybe the 13th century. Um, we move a long way to Homer himself. Um, that would be maybe the 8th century, something like that. I'm, I'm not sure if there may be experts in the room. I don't see any classicists, thank God. <laughs> well, there's Chris. <laughs> so, so it's close. Anyway, we, we move on to Homer, right? And then Homer, in many ways, informs. He's the great book. People read it or had read to them repeatedly Homer. Um, and that was, in many ways, the, the, the great legacy of, of the Greeks. Athens, in turn, right? Um, begins its great ascent, its great century, the 5th century, after a defeat, a war, the Persian War, right, and the defeat of the invading, um, um, what do we call them, the Persians, right? So Darius, Xerxes, Marathon 490, Thermopylae 480, and Athens achieves prominence. Athens becomes um, uh, the home of the remarkable flowering of, of Western culture. In fact, here's the way I, I at least look at it personally. I've seen ruins in many places in the world, right? Lots of us have. I went to the Acropolis and there's ruins. And you don't think of the end of something. To me, you think of the beginning of something. So the Acropolis, Periclean Athens, fifth century, this is sort of the great beginning uh, of West. And as I'm gonna argue in some ways of social science as well. Um, right, and out of the victory against the, um, the particularly uh, the sea victory at Thermopylae, the yeah, Athenians, at, at Solomon, sorry, um, out of, see, you get that. <laughs> out, out of these victories on land and at sea, the Athenians <clears throat> gain control of the Aegean, or largely control. And they get um, kind of a version of NATO or CETO out of this, the Delian League. Uh, maybe two and a half million people, not so many today, right? But back then, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of ally groups in a remarkably far-flung empire dominated by right, the trireme and the Athenian navy. And out of this, of course, they get their empire, they get their allies, they also get mastery of trade routes, and they have great power, right? So money, trade, the Athenian Empire. And it is this great thing in some way that gives birth to Plato, to Thucydides, to Hippocrates, to so many of the famous people we know. But it also uh, leads to what? Um, great things when they come crashing down. Um, uh, well, they need their storytellers too. Anyway, the folks in Athens in the 5th century, they love their Homer, as I mentioned before, right? They love their Iliad and their Odyssey. And look, folks, if you haven't read it ever or lately, right, um, I urge you to go do it. It's a wonderful read. To get immersed in the Odyssey, in the Iliad, takes you to, um, takes you into yourself. I, I urge you to do it. But there's some pretty bad characters and some pretty shady stuff as well when you look into Homer, right? And when you think of these heroes, you think, hmm, okay, yeah, Agamemnon's a hero, right? The House of Atreus, these are great guys, but in order to get winds to blow in the right way, Agamemnon sacrifices his daughters. I have three daughters, so I have backup. <laughs> Right? But, but still, it's just not really.
really, well, you know, what would good, pay, what good daddies do, right? And I think his wife is not going to be happy about this. And that's going to be another story, right? Don't fight a master that's got, not happy about this at all. Anyway, not a really good thing, right? No matter what, right? Um, as well, um, let's try Achilles, right? Now, he's a better guy. No, he's feuding, right, with Agamemnon and, and Atreus at the beginning of this. And why are they feuding? I think they're feuding over a girlfriend, right? You know, they've gone to Calendar Girls, and they each wanted one of the dates or whatever. And because of this, because of Briseis, we get for most of the Iliad, if you haven't read it, most of the Iliad, the great hero, Achilles, is sulking in his tent because he didn't get the girl. Right? Right? You can say that this is pretty... Oh, shows, there I go on, right? There I go on. Achilles, in a fit of rage... Right? Because he's lost his best buddy Patroclus. Um, does what? He kills Hector. That's a good thing, because that's the enemy. So killing is really good, by the way. <laughs> kills the enemy and decides that he's going to drag him around. You know, the dead body. This is not a good thing to do, right? That definitely gets people upset. Gods, too. Drag him around. And finally, you know, Achilles sort of at the end comes, comes around right after, uh, after uh, whatever Hector's dad, um, Priam. Uh, Ajax, uh, he's a hero. He's the biggest, toughest dude, by the way, by far. And when he doesn't get awarded Achilles' armor, what does he do? This is more Sophocles, sorry, but I'll blame Homer anyway. Uh, right? <laughs> what does he do when he doesn't get, was, has it the armor? Well, it turns out he has a dream, but in his dream, he decides he's going to slaughter all of the House of Atreus. They all should die. Not, not the Trojans. No, this is the Greeks. They all should die, and he kills them all. He does, and, but he wakes up and he finds out he slaughtered the sheep instead, right? Or the goats. But he thinks he's killed them all. So that's kind of the story. And to add to that, though, as well, is what you get in Homer, in the Iliad and Odyssey, of course, is that everything is sort of controlled by the gods, right? The gods come in. They intervene. They inspire. They make the decision. So if you're going to get educated, this is an interesting set of works to teach your children. Right? And as long as this is the moment of, of marathon or post-marathon or Salamis, and you're a great empire, then maybe the Homeric ideal is great. And if you're going to go fight wars, then I would say that Achilles might be exactly your guy. Get Ajax on your side. Um, maybe not so much, though, if war becomes a problem. And that brings us to Thucydides. So Thucydides' reputation comes from, well, sorry, his reputation at the time comes from losing late to a battle, right? And Brasidas destroyed, wins, and, and he gets exiled. So it's not such a good reputation at the time. But Thucydides has come to us through one book, an incomplete book, by the way, The History of the Peloponnesian. And in this book, we get, it seems, a story about power and war. And that's the way Thucydides, in many ways, is taught in international relations. But it's a deeply moving book against war. So in many ways, he gets the wrong reputation. And that move, or that sense of being against war um, would be one of the reasons we're going to see that Thucydides wants to offer something very different than Homer and the Homeric hero. So, so Achilles, Ajax, great if you want to go to war. So you think Thucydides would say, yep, Homer's my guy. But it turns out, I think we misread him. We often easily misread Thucydides that way. Uh, what else about Thucydides? Um, he lives through, the, 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 and he's a contemporary of some of the greatest of all of Western history, right? And they live together in, in Athens, including Socrates. Um, Socrates outlives him by a year. Um, Hippocrates, he actually knows and is quite close to the doctor. And in many ways, we might say that what the doctor in is doing through induction and through looking through his patients and trying to discover what's wrong with them without saying, you know, it was Apollo or you angered um, Aphrodite, Aphrodite or something, is very similar, I think, to what Thucydides is going to do here uh, with people and humanity. And by the way, to continue that analogy, if you read Hippocrates, well worth reading, few people realize that, what, 70, 80 percent of the patients he describes die. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that he saves them. <laughs> they, they mostly die. Um, as I said, 
Thucydides is a general, too. Um, he, he's up in Thrace. He's late to a battle. Um, the great Thrasidas uh, wins a battle at Amphipolis, whatever, um, um, in, in 424, and that's the end of it. The Athenians say, you didn't win. You were late. You lost this battle. We blame you, and they exile Thucydides. So Thucydides is exiled from Athens in the midst of its great war, and he gets 20 years to think it over. <laughs> and in those 20 years, actually what he does is travel around and gain the, the knowledge to write the great book, which is the history of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, Plato, um, uh, Oma, well, Plato's not, but Socrates, uh, the hero of Plato's works, is something of a contemporary. Um, we know that Socrates, the hero of, of Plato's dialogues, or most of his dialogues, is put to death by Athens four years after the end uh, of the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, and in the same way, I would say in an analogous way, that Thucydides wants to write about the tragedy, the, the terrible loss of Athens' greatness through its own mistakes, through the Peloponnesian War. So Plato writes his dialogues in great disappointment, in, in, in a rage, because Athens equally has put its own greatest person, its own greatest figure, its own greatest citizen, Socrates, in Plato's mind to death. Right? So both of these writers look at Athens and see its great sorrow. And right, if not with great sorrow, then with a cold rage about this. Uh, Plato's dialogues are so famous. Um, that is, he introduces largely the dialogic form. Others have tried to copy it, by the way, in the history of philosophy. Um, 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 the dialogues on natural religion. Um, David Hume, mm, not so good. Good philosophy, not so good. Everybody finds their own form if you're a philosopher. Plato's is the dialogues. And they're so great that there is not a single one mentioned in all the 26th century since that we don't have. Right? No one gestures at one that we don't have. Every single one. In fact, there are some that are considered spurious that he probably didn't read that are still among the 35. So Plato's dialogues are considered what, the, one of the greatest works and well worth preserving. We, we don't have any original ones, do we? Of those, unfortunately. That, that's too bad. But if you want to make some good coins, see if you can try to, you know, uh, you know, forge one. That would be a really good idea. <laughs> there aren't any that are mentioned anywhere else. You know, there is a Lincoln lost speech. I've been tempted. Lincoln gave a, a famous speech, and it's the lost speech. And I always thought, if I could find that or you know, make it up, <laughs> I wouldn't need to be your boss anymore. <laughs> sure. Okay, sorry. So, anyway, Socrates is hero, and I'll, I'll try toward the end, we'll get back to, uh, is to, to gesture why Socrates is the right kind of hero. So, so I think what we're going to get is Thucydides um, is a critic, and Socrates might be our answer, or something like that, if we have a few moments. Now, in order to cash in the idea of social science, let's also introduce the notion of science. So, just before coming into the golden age of Athens, there emerged, particularly across the Aegean, um, in a place called Miletus, um, a group of folks starting with Thales, in 585 BC, who start to offer another kind of critique. Uh, not directly a critique of Homer, but a critique of myth as understanding the world. So what is the sun? It's not an Apollo's chariot, right? It's a hot rock. A kind of new attempt to look at thesis or physics, science. So before we can get to Thucydides and Plato and social science, a science of society, we, we need science full stop. And this is the pre-Socratics. Karl Popper, who might have been in this building, so he might have dented these stairs that you have, really. He's probably here. Karl Popper wrote famously that the origin of science and knowledge is in the critique of myth. And that's sort of what the pre-Socratics were about. So when Taylor says all is water or the magnet, so that doesn't matter so much. What is important is that they're asking new questions. So the old questions tended to be who, right? What is it, you know, what, why is Jupiter, not Jupiter, Zeus, mad, and, and Hurley? The, the, the who and why. And these guys said, no, let's ask new questions. 
new questions, and this will be the basis of science, which is the what and the how, right? So we'll take out the, the divine part and we'll put in something new. Um, and, and we'll come up with a periodic table, for example, right? The Greek periodic table, earth, air, fire, and water. We have a few more now, right? But, but it's a good start, a kind of non, less moving parts and a non-motivated kind of understanding of the world. Um, right, so let's talk about social science. And I think this is really what Thucydides tries to bring us. Thucydides is not the first historian. In many ways, the first historian is someone we call Herodotus, who wrote the histories. And while there is debate, as far as I know, between when they lived and they were kind of contemporaries, Herodotus titles his book The Histories, um, and Thucydides critiques it in book one um, of his own work. Um, Thucydides intends this to be a... Thucydides understands the Peloponnesian War to be a world-changing event. So as the Persian Wars, as, the, as the, the Homeric Wars, the Persian Wars, that war is the way you understand and study the human subject, that's what he wants to do, right? The science of humanity. And what better time than in war? Yes. And he lives through one which he considers the great war, the great war of all time. Um, and I don't know whether he's right. In fact, I think it's fair to say we don't even know whether it's one war. It actually could have been many wars between 431 and, 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 and for 30 years, right? It could have been. But he ties them all together. And you know what? We believe him. We read him to this day. You can still find out that this is one of the best-selling books in 2020. Right? So we do believe him. We, we, he's in some way right about the importance of this. And in book one, he says, this is a book for all ages. If it's true, if what I'm saying is true about these people, then my claim is that here's I'm, I'm offering a skeleton key to get inside of all people at all times. So if I'm right about these folks in the 5th century, then I'm right about folks in the 5th century AD, and 1500 AD, and in 2100. So that's his, his, his gambit and move, and it's an interesting one. What's not here? Well, there's a lot that's not here, right? So the gods are not here, right? Sacrifices, well, <laughs> to gods are not here. Homeric heroes, they're not here, right? Divine intervention, right? De Deus ex machina, not here, right? None of this is present. In fact, what's missing and what he doesn't have is as important as anything that he puts in. And then there's one other interesting part of book one that's worth mentioning. Don't look for Jean-Jacques Rousseau. <laughs> Don't look for a kind of things were better then, or that humans in nature are better than they are in society. He looks at this old, again, myth that things were better in the ar archaic times. And he says, no, things were terrible. Believe me, I've studied this, and things were bad back then. We're much better now. And that's, of course, the great tragedy. The great tragedy is, in fact, that we're much better now, and look what we've done to ourselves needlessly. right? And yes, he's an Athenian. So we would today like to be equal. We call it the Athenian Peloponnesian War, or somebody does. I certainly don't. If you're Yale, that's what you call it, or something like that. Because what? We shouldn't take Athens' perspective. Thucydides does. We should have won. Why did we lose? That's what I'm going to explain to you in this. And it's a tragedy of its own kind. Now, Thucydides also talks about his method. And we can criticize this method. In fact, next Tuesday, I think I'll offer a little bit of criticism in our philosophy of history class, right? Chris Wirth will do this. And we'll offer some criticism. There's lots to criticize. But what's new here is far more important than what we might criticize in terms of the way he handled evidence. Uh, what is there was a, an umpire, not in cricket, but in American baseball, that said, I call them the way I see them. And if I don't see them, I make them up. Right? <laughs> and Thucydides does a lot of that. And he has a lot of its dialogic form. And he's quotes and he's giving us speeches, and he couldn't have been there. Uh, but let's remember, there were no written forms. Nobody went to law court and has transcripts, right? We don't have these negotiations. So what Thucydides does is the best he can, and that's his point. That he believes he's doing the best he can, which is to not rely on anything but evidence. And while the evidence is oral, 
and it's reproduced as if it's dialogue. Literally, it says Athenians make this claim and Melians make this claim. And we know that he wasn't there. He didn't hear it. He didn't memorize it. They don't have written evidence. So this is the best. And he's a great critic of the speakers. So he understands that where they might be coming from and what they're, and indeed, as a student of the sophists, I pointed out before, he uses what's called the antithesis. So he'll give one side, right, um, you know, Pericles says do this, Cleon says do the opposite, and he gives you the, the speeches either way. So that gives you, again, a sense of objectivity and balance. I was thinking about this the other day in conversation with an old buddy of mine, and I reminded him, too, that um, Jared Diamond writes about this, about how much older ancient people knew about things that we don't, because we can write it down, but we don't have to remember it. In fact, that's where I want to conclude today. Is, of course, if you extend that, you know that our students don't have to know anything. <laughs> <laughs> they have all the information <laughs> right, connected to themselves forever. And you want to pry that phone away from your kid. You know, good luck with that, right? That, that, you know. <laughs> they'll have them read about Epigenea, and then they'll, they'll give up their phone. Um, that they knew a lot, and they could memorize. So they could memorize whole dialogues, right? They could memorize Homer. So they memorize so much that we shouldn't be so shocked that Thucydides brings us a lot of these speeches. So anyway, all this in book one, and all of it ultimately about humans. What Thucydides doesn't want is heroes. Now we're going to get Pericles, uh, I'll go to the next slide. We're going to get Pericles, we're going to get a great funeral oration, we're going to break the, the evil of Cleon, the demagogue, right? There, there is all that, but that's not the point. His interest is not in heroes. He wants to go beyond that and understand humans as a group, as a larger one. So Plato argues in the Republic that there's an analogy of the city and the man, and that we're constructed, and then you understand the human, then you can understand the city, and vice versa, and wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice is the same for the city as it is for the individual. In some ways, Thucydides is making the exact same argument. So it is a tragedy. There is the tragic flaw of a hamartia, right? Um, aqua mora. There, there is this, this, this terrible thing, but it's not of an individual, and God won't come out and straighten out the moral order. There is no moral order, <laughs> as far as we can tell here. That, that's the, the great insight in, of this book. But there is human, and human nature, and the way to discover human nature is on the hottest day of the year, right? If you've seen Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, right? It's in the hottest moment. It's in the worst moment. It's in war. And what Thucydides discovers is our nature, when it's peeled and stripped away in war, is a tough thing to look at. You want to look away. You want your mythos. You want to blame the gods. He won't do that. He will not do that. So, what we get at the beginning of the history is also a remarkable insight. We call it the Thucydidean trap. That is, when you hear that, what that is is an explanation for the cause of war. And Thucydides says lots of people talk. The mythos is that really what you have is an argument over Megara, or an old argument over Potidea. You've got these allies, and they're arguing with each other, and that's the cause of the war. And he says, no, you don't get it. You want to know the cause of the war. The cause of the war is that Sparta was powerful, <laughs> and that the Delian League and the Athenian Empire and the mastery of trade, and the wealth, and prosperity, and power is brought with trade, meant that Athens was rising. And Athens' power is rising in such a way that Sparta said, wow, if we don't act now, where will we be in a short time? And so the fear of a rising power is the underlying cause of the war. So what's the cause of war? Fear and human emotion. And that's often called the Thucydidean trap. So Graham Allison, an interesting writer in, uh, in political science at Harvard, has recently, just a year ago, read a book and where he's arguing exactly the issue of why the Chinese and the United States will collide. So, so right, this Thucydides could be right. We have a social science, right? A science of humans, right? And in book two of the Republic, we get an analysis, an attempt, the first attempt at political analysis, or a science of the polity. And here, alas, democracy is really found wanting. 
Uh, the hero is Pericles, and he understands the democracy. And as long as there's Pericles, Athens has a great hope. Um, mostly because Pericles is a great psychologist and he understands democracy. Not that he celebrates it, and we get no great praise of democracy here at all. Um, but Pericles understands it. He gives an oration, an oration that is genius, that is one of the great, if I were ever teaching rhetoric, I would certainly use this. I, I would link, it's very much like Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which is what? You are the leader of a statesman, and you're what? Giving a speech in war in front of those who have died to the relations of those who have died. And what do you say? You say whatever the words, right? The world will, right? Shortly for remember, not, not, not long remember what we say here. What they will remember is what they did here. So Pericles, like Lincoln, right, takes the focus off himself and onto the heroic dead and reminding those who've given the greatest sacrifice that that sacrifice was not in vain and that there is a great thing called, called the, the nation and the people and the poets. But he's also really heady and smart, too, though. He doesn't want to praise the people too much. Um, he also understands that the people can be vindictive. So when the Spartans come and lay siege to Athens, he knows that probably what they'll do is they'll walk right past his estate and not burn that down, leave that intact, so that the Athenians will say, aha, see, you're probably going to side with Sparta. That must be a deal. So he actually goes to the Spartan demos in front of them and says, they're going to do this well ahead of time. So he understands human psychology, and that allows him to deal with the democracy. Far worse are the others. Cleon, the demagogue, the prating, prattling, self-satisfied um, disaster for Athens, who leads them into crisis. Or Alcibiades, even more, who we see featured as well in Plato, right? He's the great hope and despair of Athens. And he convinces the Athenians at the exact wrong moment to go and what? We're the greatest of all. Don't worry about this. Let's you take all of our ships and attack Syracuse, right? In Sicily. Just at the wrong moment because we're full of hubris and we can win this. And that is the, the crisis and disaster of, of Athens. Um, so uh, we get a really interesting story or look at human psychology and how that relates to uh, regime and democracy. Um, and unfortunately for Athens then, and tragically for, for Pericles, Athens suffers in the second year of this war, just a year into this war, uh, a terrible plague. A plague that undermines fundamentally Pericles' idea. The basis of this is we can't lose this war. What Sparta expects is us to come out with our hoplites, right, and order our phalanx and fight them. But no one can defeat Sparta on land. They have the great army. We're the great navy. All we have to do is avoid fighting them. They'll lay siege, but they won't be able to lay siege for long. They'll have to go back after six weeks. They can try to burn down all of our crops, but if any of you ever tried to burn down a wheat field, or, right, or chop down you know, tens of hundreds of olive trees, good luck with that, right? There, there's no shot at this. It says we don't have to do anything. And in some sense, they're right. They have enough in the city. But then they also get the plague. And the plague lays to waste a third of them. And in Thucydides' description of the plague, the plague in which Pericles himself perishes, um, and, and Thucydides gets the plague too, so he can describe it, we have what? We have the, the essence of his book, actually. The essence of it in book two. By the way, there are no books back then. They were written on papyrus. We could do this for simplicity. But the essence of it, which is, it's not because you've offended, you know, Paris is, chosen someone and offended one of the great gods. It's not because the gods are intervening. It's not that they favor Sparta. And guess what? Everyone who makes sacrifices, they get the plague and they die too. And the people who don't, they get the plague and they die too. There's, there's no difference. There's no moral here to this story at all. Athens gets the plague. It's a catastrophe. And there is no divine part of this. And there is no necessary moral meaning. There may not be any meaning at all. Right. <laughs> so we've got to hurry up here, right? Um, you told me I had 25 minutes, so I've used it up. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go very quickly here. But this is the last slide, at least, on history. 
and then we can quickly do some other things. So let me give you some greatest hits, just in case you're not going to plow through 450 pages anytime soon. Um, though I did, I reread it, and it was really great to do that for this talk. I thought it'd be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I remembered some things a little bit differently, but I'm just going to quickly tell you about a couple things. Now, the story of Mike Tillany in book three is a terrible story. Um, and it goes something like this. Basically, um, right, Creon, always Creon, comes in and says, look, these folks on Lesbos, on the island of Lesbos, they've had a revolt. And they've had a, actually a long fight, and they, the, the one faction's won, and they're revolting against us. So we've got to send the troops up there and go teach them a lesson. What should we go do? We've taken it back. What should we do? Let's send them out there and kill everyone. And that's what he says. Look, we don't know who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. It's way out there. We know this is a problem. This will send a good message. Let's kill them all. And the Athenians, the Demos, how many vote for that? They do. They have a long debate. They vote for it. Yep, let's go. Send them out. And they actually do. They, they send out the triremes. Right? The very next day, according to Thucydides, the very next day, they rethink it. <laughs> Maybe we were a little harsh. Maybe we should distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. Maybe this is a mistake. And so they reverse them. Capriciously, really, just as capriciously. And they have to send out another trireme to inter inter intercept. And they actually give them like more, more uh, white, more wine, and more oil, and more grain per person, right? So they can outgrow them and, and outstroke them, whatever they do. And they do, they do, they know they get there. It's a great story. They get there just in time. So the people of Mytilene are not all killed. <laughs> and that's the way it ends. And then Thucydides goes on. He just, he just moves on. Thucydides writes in the third person. And then Thucydides finishes the second year of the war with it. And they move on. So, hey, the Mytilenes lived. <laughs> and not, not because the demos, the capricious demos of Athens, which just doesn't care. Right? Um, so, so these guys are, are genocidal. Right? And, and consciously so. Right? It's not a compliment to Athens or democracy. <laughs> then we have the revolt at Corsairo. This actually also comes in book three, and it's fairly early on, right? It's fairly early on. There are eight books here. Um, it's not complete, but there are eight books. But the story of Corsairo is in many ways, the, some, some ways, the most remarkable and amazing. There you have a civil war, right? A terrible civil war between the oligarchs and the Democrats, and brother against brother, and lots of strife. And Thucydides' description of it is horrifying. And he has this, this one a remarkable line into it, that as revolution thus ran its course from, from city to city, in, as Corsaira, it's an island, right? Uh, Corfu, I guess it would be called now, right? Um, that as, as these, these, these groups are fighting each other, um, by the way, we forget. When Pericles brilliantly says, don't go fight them on the plain. Don't fight Sparta. We, we dominate the sea. Well, the Spartans can't dominate, well, they don't dominate the sea until, what, 411 or something, right? So there's actually no direct battle. And if there's no direct battle, and you have hundreds of allies, what you have is just a terrible, terrible story of civil war, of, of, of revolution, of faction against faction, of siege. And, and siege just doesn't matter, man, woman, or child, right? So maybe the direct battle is the better way to go, funny enough. Because this is a terrible story of, of war over 30 years. Anyway, Corsair is about the worst, and he, he mentions that here that even words change their meaning. And the, the word for word is the same as the word for reason, right? Logos, right? The, the, the notion of, of, of rational speech. And that words, they, they don't even know how to talk to each other. And I think this is something, when we get to the end, that is, has great meaning. It has great meaning for, for Plato and what Plato is interested in. It's great meaning for us. Because I'm struck by how in the United States, and trying to keep up with this and report on things American, how difficult it is to find something to say, and someone on the left and someone on the right says, yeah, I see it. I see that. I disagree, but I see that. The, the quiddity, the thisness is disappearing. And I think Thucydides, 26 is gesturing in exactly the same thing as Corsair. Words, when you don't have words, what do you have? When you don't have reason, there's no communication. Without communication, there is only, thank you Foucault, power. Right? There's only power. And then we've sort of 
lost human, right? But humans can descend to lone reason. Power wins all the time. And that brings us sort of to the, to the, the high point or low point, depending on how you want to see it, of Thucydides. And that's the Melian dialogue. And it is a dialogue. It, you know, it's ATH for Athenians and MEL for Melians. Now, Melos is, a, is, a, is an island and on the, and a part of the Delian League. And Melos decides that the Athenians, the Delian League is shit. <laughs> Have we recorded it? <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> and they're right, right? right? It's, it's a corrupt kind of empire now, and the Athenians are extracting a lot, and they look at the Melian, look at the Peloponnesian opportunity, they look at Sparta as, as, as a chance to break the yoke of Athens and leave. So the Athenians send their navy to, to Melos and say, hey, guess what, guys? You're done, right? You gotta give up, you gotta capitulate, because we gotta have you in the empire. Why? You're not worth anything to us. You're small, but if we let you go, or let you be neutral, that's what they ask for, neutrality, then everybody else is going to ask for the same thing. So it is our empire at stake here. So guess what? Here's the army. Deal with it. And the Melians say, no, we don't want to tell our people that. We're going to talk to you separately as, 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 as a group of, of envoys, and we want to reason with you. And the great answer that the Athenians give is, no, reason speech is between equals. And we're not equal. So since we're not equal, we're not going to reason with you. And they say, oh, OK, you're not going to reason with We know we're in the right. We don't care. Right? Just capitulate. We're done. And the Melians say, oh, now that's not so good. Come on, we know we're in the right. And if we know we're in the right, then the gods will intervene. And the Athenians say, ah, you've been reading your Plato, your Homer, sorry. You've been reading your Homer. Go to that. Go to it, right? You're systematically miseducated, you fools, right? And they say, oh, no, then the Spartans will come. No, we've taken care of that. They're not showing up. So you have one choice, give up. Or two choices, sorry, give up or die. And the Melians say, we'll take our trust in being right and with God. And so what do the Athenians do? They kill all the men, all the boys. They sell all the women into slavery, and there is no Melos anymore. They simply send their people in. It's gone. So there is no divine justice. There is no retribution. There is just the fact. There is just power. That's all there is. Shock. And this comes, right, this, this is the idea of, of, of what of only positive law would come out of this in many ways. Not really happy, huh? <laughs> and that's the Athenian democracy. The Athenian democracy wasn't happy with Socrates either. And so they obliged him to drink a hemlock milkshake, right, and put him to death. Um, and it is in this response to this that Plato, right, writes his dialogue, right, in, in, a, in a deep rage against killing of Socrates. And so he recovers in many ways Socrates. So his first book is, or our first dialogue is, is uh, the apology that goes through the trial of Socrates that clearly shows how trumped up and false it is. Um, it also shows that Socrates could have gotten himself off, absolutely. But Socrates says, you know, I don't argue in law courts. I've never been in here before. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to lie now. And so I'm not going to flatter the democracy. And they say, well, well, at least you can propose an alternative now that we found you guilty to death by, by hemlock. And he says, yeah, OK, here's what you should give me. Lunch every day at the Pridenum with the Olympic heroes, because that's what I deserve. And they're trying to weigh that up, and it doesn't take too long to weigh up to put him to death. Right? So Plato writes about this guy. And again, Plato's argument, I think, in many ways, is that is, is very similar to what we see in Corsairo, which is what is the new thing? And the new thing that gives birth to the Greeks and to Athens is words, is the logos, is reasons which we don't have time to get into this. I think the argument is by linguists that the phonetic alphabet or phonetics, right, allows you to intertranslate all these languages. Once you can intertranslate them, especially in Miletus, by the way, that's where, where it is, you can intertranslate them and you find out everybody's got their same God story. And they're all, they're unique God stories until you get them all, and then you start to parse them and realize they're in common. And you start to critique these things, not as truth, but as myth, right? So from this kind of language, this critique of myth, we get 
Plato introducing us to Socrates, the very same guy that Athens puts to death. And Socrates, in many ways, I think Plato is arguing, is going to replace, he's going to be the new hero. Right? He's going to be the hero of epic. And indeed, Socrates goes on this incredible journey, except unlike Odysseus, he doesn't have to go find the monsters. They come to Athens, right, in the form of the Sophists, right, Protagoras and Gorgias and ever. And he's always walking around. And all of the dialogues begin with these framing things, which the philosophers skip, and I think is the greatest part, where Socrates is always going somewhere, coming somewhere, coming back. He's always in motion. So it's an epic journey, and he's an epic hero. He's also obviously a tragic hero, right? Put to death in, in the Apology, right? He also refuses to escape, right? They try to break him out, right? Credo tries to break him out of the prison. He says, why would I leave, right? I've always obeyed the laws of Athens, right? And so I can't leave, I can't run away. So he's a remarkable, tragic figure too. And I think when he's dying, he talks about, in, in a few days, he's drunk in the hemlock, uh, I'll be walking in fair Fithia again, which is a direct, clear gesture, and, and jab at Achilles, right? So that, that he's replacing him there. He's also a comic hero, believe me. If you've ever read the dialogues, he is the funniest guy around, right? <laughs> he's never cracking jokes, but he's always being ironic, right? He's always teasing. He never means what he says, right? And indeed, in all of the dialogues, we do get Socrates laughing one time. Socrates laughs, right? You've read the Gospels, right? You can read the synoptics. Jesus never laughed. <laughs> cries, <laughs> right, at least in Mark, right? Socrates never cried, but he laughed. When did he laugh? He drank the hemlock, right, in, in Phaedo, and all of his buddies, all of his athletes, they're all crying. Socrates, you're dying, you're bleeding out, and they're all crying, and he laughs at them. Because you guys haven't understood a thing I've taught you, right, that the body's not important, right, that the, that's not not the, it's not the material, it's the spiritual, it's the forms, it's the good, and now you guys are crying. <laughs> Who cares? I'm probably going someplace better. Right? And he laughs at them. Um, in the dialogue called the Euthydemus, I think we get a really interesting explanation. Socrates is leaving the Agora, but his, his daimon tells him to stay, and these two brothers, Dionysodorus and Euthydemus, are in the Agora, and what are they doing? Well, these guys used to be arms salesmen, and now they've learned this new game called rhetoric. Right? And they're going and, they're, and they make fun of Socrates and say, are you a father, right? Dogs are fathers, so you must be a dog. And all these stupid things where what? They're misusing words, right? They're playing word games called heuristic. But they're, they're not engaged in the logos at all, right? And I think the point here is that Plato's again analogizing. He's saying, look, it used to be a world of Homeric heroes, Ajax and Achilles. We're in a new world in a new time where the new thing is the written language, is words and reason. Is science. And while these idiots are caught and done and they're moving from, from, from warfare to wordplay, right? They're nonsense. But Socrates is the new thing. He is the new hero. And his ideal is science, right? Is knowledge. He's the hero of knowledge. I think that is ultimately Plato's claim. Anyway, so Plato and Thucydides. Um, following on from the pre-Socratics, from New ideas and new questions. Not who and why, but what and how, right? The new kind of thesis, the science, to replace mythos. And I think in the great crisis of Athens, you get the two folks who say, yes, what we really need is a science, but we should apply it to us, right? A science of society, a science of psychology, of, of motivation, a science of human beings. And this is what they try to come up with. So we should have some sort of conclusion, shouldn't we? Right? Uh, some sort of conclusion, right? Thou, not shall, thou shall not commit a social science, by the way. I'm tempted to say as a humanities person. Um, but, but again, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a conclusion where we can bring Trump back in, right? Um, oh, Stephen Harper, you called it. Uh, a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, uh, Peter Winter says, who, who says, who says the same thing, though. Um, uh, in, in a really interesting uh, book called The Idea of Social Science, or the not idea of one, um, that I think that Donald Trump was gesturing at something, whether we knew it or not, that's very important. And that is that ultimately, an informed citizenry is everything in a democracy. 
right? And that without with systematic misinformation, we run into a crisis. And that crisis is, of course, one of laws are only as good as the people who make them. And if the people who make them just don't know anything, then they're going to make, they're going to be corrupted and they're going to make bad laws. And bad laws will lead to the collapse or decline and collapse of democracy. Absolutely. That's pretty obvious, right? I think we all agree with that. But I think there's something we might add to it now, which is even a greater worry. And that is that issue of reason and logos and what the word, what words mean. When we gesture and we agree what words mean, actually I think what we mean is we agree on a thing. And it's great to agree on a thing, and naturally, depending on political psychology, you might be on the left and think that thing should move to the right, or you might be on the right and think that thing should move to the left, whatever it is. But now I think things are changing in the era of fake news so that we don't even agree on what the thing is over which we might have political opinion and healthy debate. I'll give you the quickest example I can, and that's related to not so much dialectic as technology. And again, going back to the phone and the Facebook and the internet. Um, I have two computers, one at home and one at work, right? I promise you, Jonathan, the home one is, is mine. Right? <laughs> but I, I have two computers, and on the computer at work, I may be interested in, say, typing in travel to the United States, because I did that once upon a time, right? And if you do that sum, you're the sum of your clicks. When I get to work, it always seems to want to tell me, are you sure you've been to the United States recently? Don't you think you ought to take another trip, right? And it's a discount today, and look where you can go today. I mean, constantly, and here, go distance, cheap, and Grand Canyon for free, constantly. Now, at home, I find that I buy wine. And so I'm interested in that. So every day when I get up and I'm doing some work after my event and looking there, my computer actually tells me, are you sure you're not drunk yet? You should have some wine right now. You know, it's who cares that it's early. And look, it's a discount. So the same exact thing is true in our politics, right? Absolutely. This is the essence of fake news. Because actually if I went to work and just look up Fox News and hate Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell hero and MAGA, and then I go home, and I look up, what, um, Chuck Schumer, greatest man in the world, how can I give more money to the Democratic Party? Actually, I can just contact my family, which is how all their feeds, right? Whatever it is, that in time, if I just go to what are considered neutral news sources, like real clear politics, which just accumulates the, the various things from the New York Times to Washington Post, from Fox, from Financial Times, from the Economist, all those, it actually shifts. So that over time, you can't see the progressive stuff on the Fox side, and you can't see the um, conservative stuff on the progressive side. You can't see them. Actually, it disappears. So that over time, actually, the news itself is not there. So that the news one side gets is an entirely different news than the other side. And I think that's kind of where we are in course science where words have lost their meaning, or we're in that danger zone where we're close to that. So that I know that if I ask a question of certain people on the right in the United States about an event, they'll either characterize it entirely differently or not know about it. And if I bring up with the, another group entirely, they will completely characterize it differently, or they won't know about it at all. On that happy note, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Time for questions? We're, we're right on 8 o'clock, folks. So if there are some questions, then I would suggest that uh, you let them run out. <laughs> Do we have any questions? We can just go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we can go then. That's good. <laughs> oh, just about. Oh, well, just about. So how do you fight what you just described? Can you keep the logos? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, but I have one because I experienced it yesterday. There is an answer. But it, it's, it's, not, it's not on this. So the University of Canterbury is an extraordinary place. So I thank all of you guys who are alumni, and, and it's 
your university. It's an extraordinary thing. And right in front of the College of Arts, we had yesterday our, what, um, exhibition for recruiting students into all the various campus organizations, right? And it was great. So it was a little loud, but there it was. Great. And it was really interesting to have the right to like people right next to the National Party. And, and the cannabis folks were put right in between Christian Union and, and the Catholic Society. And she was wearing, she was dressed up as a cannabis leaf. You know, and, and I realized that's the answer. Because what you see are people who completely disagree with each other. And when you look from a distance, just a little distance, there are students. They're similar. They're having a good time. And they understand that between them, they might want an education. They might care about the environment. They might want to send their kids to school without being shot at by snipers. Right? There's all kinds of reasons to think you share something. So that's the best answer. But it was, it was in person. Right? So, so this is a positive feedback loop. The best thing we can have is negative feedback. Amen. Right? <laughs> so what we, do, what we do in class is another example. So if you get to know your students, right? You find their strengths, and you just leave that alone, right? And you play to their weakness. You, you get them to steel man things. You get them to decide about themselves. And once they've come up with something about themselves, then look for something that's different from them, and then give that the benefit. Not the thing that's like you. That's easy. Challenge, find the thing that's not like you. Give me the best argument on that side. Do that all the time. Then when you know they're wrong, it's great, because you've given, you've given the best argument that you think is wrong. Right, so I think he's trying to say that they're related, right? So I don't know that I would decide. What is it? Karl Marx famously says that men make their own history, but not in the way they choose or in their own. Right, so, that, that, right, so we're, I, I think he's, Thucydides is a he here, right? Yeah. Marx is trying to, okay, I, I think he's trying to say that they're connected. And that the method of analysis of each, so the individual psychology, and the group psychology and the polity are in ways mirrors of each other. In fact, Plato said, if you want, let's talk about justice for the individual, right? That's book one of the book. What's right for the individual? And he says, that's too hard. So let's spend ten, nine more books or whatever, and we'll look at the city. And if we can find what works right for the city, then maybe that's the way the soul should be balanced, too. So I think that I'm, I'm going to dodge your question if we're going to say which comes first or which is causative. They both are. And the same way that people are determined and they're free. Right? So you're, you're hungry. You're going to go out now. You're going to go to McDonald's. I'm sure. And get a cheeseburger. And you think you're choosing on this long menu of what to eat. But maybe you haven't had enough protein. So you think you're free, but... You know. Yeah, they're choosing. <laughs> are we done? No, we're not. One more, sorry. Sure. Um, just going off of both questions. Like, if, if we... Uh, I guess the, the function of society. So our identities lie very much within what society, like what social classes we're from, what roles we play. And also going on to the first initial question of how do you change that? If we're so fundamentally becoming such a globalized society, and more and more of that society is becoming uneducated about these things, like you've only got such a small percentage that is trying to make that difference. Like how does how do you, you know? How do you, how do you fight that? Like, if, if everything that you're trying to do to make create change is being assimilated into a society that's continuously losing its its speech, its its connection, then how do you how do you change that? Because aren't you forever fighting a battle that's always losing? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'd like to be optimistic, <laughs> and I'd like to end on, a, on, a, on an optimistic note. Okay? I know that the tradition for a very long time, like Chris knows about this. Fair amount, so 800 years or more uh, of basically having juries, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of juries in some ways is that 
you know, in a community at least, right, we kind of have faith that in a community people can decide what's right and wrong and get a good sense of that. And so while they may not be experts to know whether it is wrong or not to take a vaccine, right, um, right, and we're going to have to rely on scientists or, or what the reserve board should do about interest rates next year or something, that we still kind of rely on people to, to not be so, so, so certain that they know little and they know so little that they can't make decisions. I, I think we should probably respect them and their remarkable ability to make decisions. Um, I worry more about the, the source of information than, than the character of the folks. I, I think they're pretty sturdy. I have some faith in that. All eight billion of us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks, guys. Thank you.